I am so glad you reached out to us and I want you to just briefly explain why you thought Black Women in Radio would be the platform um, to connect with. Well, for one, I think that I, I got a lot of inquiries kind of to um, ask, asking me, you know, what happened with the show. Um, if you are familiar, it was, if you're not familiar, it was um, a reality TV show based, not really based on dating, but it followed three couples around and we um, pretty much documented our journey to the altar in spite of, you know, the obstacles that normal couples face. So um, I felt like towards the end, I was kind of the bad guy a little bit, you know, okay. like um, everybody was rooting for the relationship to work. And I'm the one who said, no, you know, I, that's not the direction that I want to go. Or from what you saw, you know, it appeared as if I was the one who said no. So I got a lot of um, inquiries from people wanting to talk to me, ask me, oh, what, it, what happened? Tell your side of the story. But I decided that instead of just going on all of these interviews instead of choosing all of these different platforms who I honestly, I don't know who's controlling that narrative. I feel like that's what got me in this situation to begin with is signing up for something and not having any control over my own narrative essentially. So I decided that I wanted to go with a platform for one that is more positive, way more positive. I love what you guys are doing. I love the, the way you guys are promoting a positive image of women of color, period, especially in media. So that's what made me um, really choose to go with you guys to kind of tell my side of things. I really appreciate that. And I am so touched that the work that we're doing is making a difference outside of, you know, uh, the industry stuff. Um, uh -huh. So you are, you know, you're more than welcome to share what your side of everything is. Um, in, in the same vein, I would like us to give us at least enough information to other people who are interested in doing some of the same things to maybe, you know, they won't jump into the same pitfalls or whatever that, that you found yourself <laughs> no. in. But, you know, I mean, that's life because we're, we're going to try is. anything. You, you try it, you figure it out. It doesn't work out, then you know, but you have to try. So Absolutely. it was interesting. There's something that you mentioned about um, everyone wanted to talk to you because you said no. Let me just first say, as a woman, <laughs> why can't we say no? We can say no. I don't know. And you know what? That's one of the, that is one of the biggest lessons that I've learned, not just in doing TV, but in general, in my business, in my home life, in my family life, I'm allowed to set my own boundary. If I don't want something, I'm allowed to refuse it. And I feel like we, particularly the community that I'm a part of, mostly women of color, younger women, uh, millennial women, I feel like we're so hard on each other, telling each other what to do, telling each other how to live our lives and the decisions that we ought to make. But I've learned that I'm the one who had to deal with it. You know what I mean? So listening to everybody else pretty much kind of got me in a situation that I wasn't happy with. So I've learned to, despite any criticism that I might receive, I'm going to do what makes me happy. And you get, I'm, you can't please everybody. Somebody's always going to have something to say. So I've truly learned to do what is best for myself and my family and my household. And you know, that is a stance that's very difficult for women to do so. people in general, but especially women because, and, and especially black women, because um, when we're given opportunities, especially in, in media or in corporate world, and we set a boundary and we decide, well, this is not working for me in the way that I thought it would. So no, people look at it like, how dare you? How dare you? Know? you? How dare you? We just gave you an opportunity and you're passing it up. Well, the thing I think that we need to pay attention to are our values. What do you value? Absolutely. You know, everyone Absolutely. has a level of success, a, a, a different idea of what success looks like. And for some, it's money and they will go to whatever end in order to achieve that goal. For others, mm -hmm. it's image. For others, it's, it's you know, uh, family. So when we have opportunities like you had 
to sign a contract to do something really huge in your life, you know, and you're thinking, wow, I'm going to break this new platform and, and, uh -huh. and do something different with my career and only to find out there are writers and they have a different idea of where they uh, want to carry this. Absolutely. And when absolutely. you have a writer writing and a producer producing, they get to do it the way they want to do the it. The way that they want that to do it. it. Yeah, that's the truth of the matter. So I think the best that we can do, especially to get more positive media out there, is to do it our damn selves. Do it. <laughs> I 100% agree. And I think that that is a huge part of the problem that we're facing is there's not enough um, women of color or women who look like us, period. Young women, business women, women of color, what have you. There's not enough of us in general who are in those seats that control the outcome. We need to create our own projects, create our own um, fields that we're producing in and essentially have more control over what we're putting out. Because what I've, not just what I've learned in this experience, what I know as being in media, I've been in media, social media marketing for 10 years. I'm giving, giving away my age a little bit, but well, I've been in- Look, I do it all the time, don't worry. <laughs> I've been in social media and media in general for 10 years. And what I know is that the masses believe what is put in front of them the oh, most. Absolutely. Absolutely. Believe what they, they believe what they see the most. So if somebody else is controlling what we're, what's put out about us, naturally that's just what the masses are going to believe. So if we want to change that and we want to shift that, we have to put out more of our own story. Absolutely. And that's one reason why Black Women in Radio exists, Absolutely. is to put more positive images out there, not mm -hmm. just industry women, but my hope was to use um, what I know, and that's the radio industry, to mm -hmm. attract other people, you know, and perhaps there'll be a domino effect and more and more people will put out more positive um, mm -hmm. media and, and imaging out there. Let's talk a little bit about saying no, because there are people who are listening who have a problem with that, you know? With saying no. I know I do. Yeah. So, so <laughs> why, do. What, where does that come from? Where, where do you think that comes from inside of you? Why you have a, a difficult time saying no? I will, in keeping transparency, I think that a huge part in my life in general, why I won't say no to somebody is for fear of, the, the way that they'll perceive me. I know when I was doing TV and media and even in business sometimes, depending on the room I'm in, I don't want to come across as that bitchy, angry black woman. I don't want to come across as rude or I don't want to come across as aggressive, you know, because that truly is not who I am. So if I don't want people to have that idea of me and I don't want it to impact my projects going forward or my relationships going forward, then I have such a hard time essentially sticking up for myself. I feel like I've been put in situations, especially doing TV. I feel like I was put in situations where I should have been speaking up for myself. I should have said, no, I don't want to do that. I should have said, no, we're not taking it in that direction. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to act like that. I'm not going to yeah. pretend like that. Or, you know, I just should have done something differently and refused certain things. But I felt like because I didn't want to come across as selfish, I didn't want to come across as aggressive. I didn't want to come across as ungrateful for a happy that other people are telling me that I should have. Yes. Um, I didn't want to come across that way, so I didn't say anything, and it essentially came back to bite me. Yes, and it usually does, because that's the lesson that we're supposed to learn for ourselves so that we set boundaries. But it's very interesting. You said just about every buzzword I've heard in my lifetime about <laughs> why I shouldn't say no, whether it was a relationship or a job. You know, you're selfish, you're, you're bitchy. Oh, the angry black woman, how dare you stand up for yourself? You should right. be grateful, you know, I even love you. Or you should be grateful, I even gave you a job. Or you should be, you know, and, and, and it just minimizes who we are as women and as humans. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's like there's a standard from which we are only supposed to in society to lay down and let anybody walk over us because yep. we ought to be grateful we have what we have. And but I just have 
I'm sorry to interrupt you. I've <laughs> taken so much time um, just contemplating on that, working that out, unpacking that, as they say. I've taken time wondering about that and why things are that way. Um, it's a, kind of a sticky situation. You know, you step on a lot of toes when you talk about it, but it's in my experience, I have seen so much criticism as the woman in the situation. And I feel like the man involved was almost like just getting credit for being present. I feel like in our community period, we are so satisfied with a man just being present. Maybe that's because a lot of us aren't used to having, you know, we, we have broken homes commonly in our community or a lot of us we're used to being told that we don't deserve a happy family or whatever it is. I feel like our community is so used to a broken family or we're so used to you know these stereotypes that I feel are placed on us that we're giving passes to people just for being there and I feel like that's essentially in my situation what was happening I would I would never be told oh he treats you like a queen you know you should stay with him all I would hear and I could not make this up I wouldn't make it up all I would ever hear is she has a son and he is still willing to deal with it. Mm. He is there for her and her son. He is there for her, even though she has this baggage. It would never be focused on, you know, clearly he loves her or he treats her right. It would, it was almost as if I should be satisfied that he even wants to be there. And I feel like I started thinking about it and I feel like that really is common in our community. And it's not to insult black men at all. I love black men. Yes, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I love black men, so it's not to assault the, insult them, but I feel like it's the expectations are different. And I feel like if we're going to do better and if our men are going to do better, realistically, we have to change those expectations. You as a man and as my husband, it's not okay for you to just be there. Yes. It's yes. not. I expect more out of you and you should expect more out of me because I'm going to give more as your wife. You're not going to just be there. If we're dating for four years, why wouldn't you have a relationship with my child? Yes. Me personally, that would be weird if you weren't in a or relationship. Or how about start it without you having to, to without you know, me having to set push it up in and that push, direction. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Because you that are really, that is what should happen. Yes. You are speaking to so many women's um, experiences with relationships. Let's, let's go back a little bit and talk about just men being present in in the family um mm -hmm. it does happen it it happens way too often and i think part of it is because forgive me don't don't give me a bunch of uh letters on this but men have gotten away from doing the personal work that they need to do to want to do better to want to show up differently to want to do something totally different from what dad did but i think our society hasn't healed mentally and yes. from so many traumas, generational traumas. We're carrying the same traumas that we had as slaves. We are because our families live it every day with even with the jobs that we're able to get or not able to get. Right. But it's a lot of it is because of self-confidence and yep. wanting to do better. And so with men just sitting, um, you know, being satisfied with, oh, well, I show up. Well, you know, oh, I, I paid the mortgage or I got your nails done, so you should be happy. Well, I'm here. I'm, I'm not out with, you know, so-and-so right now. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you should be happy. But that is not a healthy relationship. A healthy it's relationship not. evolves, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. With the times, and you hit the nail on the head, what that puts me in the mind of, to reference my own experiences and my own family, my parents, I feel like, like the generation that they came up in, my father loved him to death. I love my daddy. He's my example of a great man is my father. He was so good to my mom. But verbally, he wasn't as expressive of his love, you know, like physically, even sometimes hugs and kisses. Growing up, he wasn't as expressive of yes. that because the way he showed his love was that he was a provider. He mm -hmm. came home every day. He paid all the bills. He bought us whatever, like whatever. I grew up in such a great neighborhood. I grew up in a great household. I never went without. And that is how my father showed his love. My mom stayed home. She was the nurturer. 
She gave the hugs and kisses. She kissed the boo-boos and she, you know, she told us how much they both loved us. That's, that's how their that's how their dynamic worked. Mm -hmm. But I'm not my mama. Yes. Okay. I'm I work myself. I run my own business. I uh I leave the home myself. I bring money in myself. I buy things. I pay bills. So you're gonna have to come up with another way to show me that you love me. And I think that's important to learn your partner and learn not just who they are and what generation we're coming in because I really think that that needs to shift. I think that a lot of men are expecting that. They're expecting to just be able to show up. I'm just here and that's good enough. It's not good enough and it doesn't have to be. And I think that it's important to learn your partner and learn their love language. Learn how you tell them that you love them. Learn what they perceive as love. And I think it takes time to do that and a lot of people just aren't willing to take the time and I think that's why you get into situations like that. Kiki, I'm so glad you mentioned the fact that, uh, is it okay for me to call you Kiki? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, that's that's a habit that a lot of people have, you know, shortening folks' names. I'm like, I tell you, you can do that. But thank you. Um, mm -hmm. When you talk about love language, love languages, that's something that everybody needs to know about when it comes yes. to relating to people, period. So for me, relationships, every relationship that you have, no matter if it's your, your neighbor, your spouse, your girlfriend, friends, bosses, you know, you being a leader yourself, you are still cultivating relationships. So a love language could look like um, money, you know, mm -hmm. giving things that I feel loved. Right. Or it yep. could look like words of affirmation, you know, yep. Kiki, I love you. You are such a beautiful person. You see, it, it, it rubs <laughs> off, especially when you're genuine about that. Mm -hmm. um, what's the other love language? Uh, words of affirmation. There's, um, oh gosh, there are two more. There's kind acts, uh, words of affirmation. Kind oh, acts, words of affirmation, presence, you know, mm -hmm. giving money. So kind acts and, and presence are two different things. You know, mm -hmm. presents are, you know, Tiffany diamond ring, five carats. Thank you. Or <laughs> anybody get that? Or <laughs> um, yeah. just doing something kind for someone, um, you know, constantly taking the trash out without having to be asked well, or uh -huh. washing dishes without having to be asked that kind of thing. I forgot the other one, but look it up. The, the, uh, four Love Languages by Gary Chapman, I believe it is. So for those people who are listening and watching, that's what we're talking about. So those love languages absolutely work even when you're parenting, you know? And absolutely. Yes. And so that's something, here's a tip, men, that is something, or people who are in relationships, period, that we all need to pay attention to because just because I said I love you doesn't mean that it landed in the same way that the, where the person is receiving it, they may need something different. Absolutely. They may need to just see you in action. So just yep. sitting there and being present, that's not enough. It's not enough. And I learned that about myself too. And I actually, I took a second and I did look it up. Words of affirmation, acts of service, quality time and physical touch. Quality so, time and physical. How could I forget the two that I love? Physical I touch. I was going to say, those are my two. Those last yes. two, those are my two. I yeah, want I your wanna, time I want to feel, yeah. And I like affection. Like, you don't have to buy me anything. I don't mind gifts. I'm mm -hmm. actually, it's weird, even though I don't really, I, was, I like to receive um, physical uh, affection. I'm not really a giver of that. I'm not going to come up and hug you. The way that I do it is acts of service and, um, like, buying you things. I give gifts as well. But I think that it just takes getting to know that person, you know, and I think that for one, I think that a lot of us aren't even taught that to begin we with the love not. languages is it's something that I honestly was exposed to as an adult in my adult life. Like recently, I learned that people respond to things differently in the way that they define what love is. And that's how you show somebody you love them is to even take the time to figure out how. Absolutely. And not assume. So mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're working on some deficits here. We're assuming that love looks like the way it looked in our families. Some of our families were jacked up 
<laughs> dysfunctional and jacked up, you know, but we're still operating on that mindset that, oh, love looks this way. And when you become an adult and you start to react, respond that way, you end up having so many broken relationships because that is not the love language that they connect with. And you've not Absolutely. even stopped to ask, you know, there's something that we do very often as black women. We assume, talking about just men, you know, just showing up, we assume because we got our hair done and our nails did, <laughs> you know, and he paid for it, he's uh -huh. the man. Yeah. You can do that yourself. That is true. Let me back up to say we're grateful, but your value, your self-worth should not be matched it's with so somebody good. getting your hair done or putting mm -hmm. gas in your car. We've got to level Not up as all. women. Don't you believe that? Uh, no, I 100% agree. I 100% agree. I think that there is much more um, that should be expected by us. Not just saying, oh, tell the men they need to step up. I feel like a bigger part of the problem is what we are accepting because they're only going to do what we allow. So if I keep allowing you to do that and I don't require any more than that, then why would I be mad that you're not giving it? I really can't complain about something that I never asked for in the first place. And sometimes we don't know to ask because we don't mm -hmm. know ourselves. Ourselves. So, and we I think that before ourselves. jumping in, before jumping into a serious relationship, you owe it to yourself and the other person to take the time to learn that. I believe that I'm going to take it a step further. You're absolutely right, Kiki, but I want to take it a step further. That also means in sex too. It took me forever as an adult thinking my mindset was the guy knew how to do everything. They don't know anyone either. <laughs> so here we are as women giving them all the power. You know, uh -huh. oh, well, he did it this way, so it must be right. No, <laughs> but that, that just that just goes back to the fact that men just showing up, just like women, we just show up, we assume too, we're going to flip this. Mm -hmm. We assume that men just, you know, want a, 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 a meal maybe. There are some women uh -huh. that, that won't do that. Maybe they assume that men just want sex, you know? Uh -huh. So these are assumptions, but we've not stopped to ask really ask, not verbally ask, but watch and really dig in what makes this person tick? What is it right. that, you know, how do I get to this person so that they know that I really love them? And we hear words, words aren't doing it. We hear, I love you all the time, don't we? It, it's not going to do it. You got to have some backup. Right. You have to have I some backup. I will say when it comes to valuing yourself and kind of learning, asking for those things, I think a big part of that too is learning who you are and what you bring to the table. Absolutely. I'll be honest about my experience in relationships in the past. I haven't been in, I've only been in two serious relationships, but in dating in the past, I think that I myself had to realize what I brought to the table. I say that because growing up, I was always cute. I was little, I was adorable, I was really, really girly. Are, I like my hair to stop. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I always heard, oh, you're so pretty, you're so pretty, you're so pretty, you're so pretty. I I didn't hear as much the other things about substance and who I was to where I as an adult started to realize what else I brought to the table. I'll say when I first started out kind of dating and getting in relationships and even some in my first relationship in my first marriage I think that what I would feel like I brought to the table oh I'm so pretty like how how could you want anybody else I'm so super pretty um I clean the house I cook I do this and I do that and it got to a point where that's not enough and the bad Thing about being and a trophy or shocking? It's I know, but it's that there there I got I got into a situation where that was not enough. Yeah, yes, you're, yeah, you're pretty, but she listens to me. Mm -hmm. She's not even as cute as you, but she makes me feel a certain, a way. certain way. You know what I mean? And so I had to learn to dig into who I was and realize what else I'm bringing to the table. So so that I wouldn't accept anything less than that. Because when you're just a trophy, or if it's just physical, people get bored with that. They really do. They'll throw that away. Even the prettiest luxuries at times, if you've seen them enough, you're going to get bored with it. Case so. in point, all of the celebrity relationships that you mm -hmm. know of who, where mm -hmm. their men cheated, 
case in point right it's there. not enough there you has know, to and be you're like, how can you perfect. not want you know this person beyonce or or, or j-lo or or halle berry it's like what are you thinking all of them mm-hmm. yes and, but, but that's we because are relationships them. are deeper than that we mm-hmm. are them we are Absolutely. doing some of making some of the same mistakes in our mm-hmm. relationships assuming assuming that um the way we express ourselves lands the way we're thinking it lands with the other person i did that too i thought that if i married someone that didn't look as attractive as me and he would treat me like this queen girl did i get my head handed to me that'll work but these are childhood assumptions <laughs> isn't that crazy <laughs> I'm laughing because I, I've heard that and I've been there. Isn't it crazy? That's like you talk about a frisbee to the head. Yes. When <laughs> like when you get into a relationship with somebody because of that and they get to acting up and you like what? Girl, that'll send you to church, I'm telling you. It's cause it, it's heartbreaking because you you're you're again, the way we were raised and all of the um um verbiage that we've heard up until adulthood is is what's driving us but it's all subconscious so nobody Mm -hmm. told you or i i'm sure that you're so pretty you're going to be able to get anything you want all we heard is that you're really pretty and you'll be able to um do a lot in the world they didn't say go marry somebody and assume that just because you're pretty you're going to get everything you need or go get this contract and you're going to be the the best actress in the whole wide world because you no, it's not that so you're absolutely right kiki when you said you have to stop and find out what you bring to the table so how mm-hmm. how did you go about that? What how did you after you got knocked upside the head with the reality check? <laughs> how did you dig that up, the uh, information out of yourself? Uh, you know what I think it took um, it took some of the worst experiences in my life for one to bring that out of me. It took time. There were times where um, that's the last thing I was thinking about was my appearance or there are times where I'm in such this low, dark place. I have to pull from other places to get out of those spaces. And I think that I realized what I truly bring to the table because it's not even to say that I wasn't bringing that to the table before. It's not like I was in a marriage or a relationship like, oh, well, I'm here. I'm pretty. Like, that should be good enough. I was bringing all of those other things to the table, but because that person seemed to value that so much in the beginning I thought okay cool that's yeah enough. that's true too yeah. that's enough but when they started to get bored with that mm-hmm. I, had that's to, true. I had to remind myself of all the other things that I brought to the table and therefore I changed what I would accept and I had to realize myself like I'm not here just because I'm cute there are other girls in the world there's plenty of beautiful women in the world that shouldn't be enough for anybody I think getting into a relationship where that was a huge focus was the physical and how beautiful they thought I was that should have been a red flag in the beginning because well, that's I do, most of our I bring, relationships I bring so much more to the table than that I even changed the way like I communicate with people now and what catches my attention somebody telling me oh girl you are so oh you are bad you are fine that does not catch my attention as much as somebody saying you're smart yes I love talking to you that to me is so much different than you immediately focusing on the physical now it's not to say the physical doesn't play a part because naturally we're human it's going to but I have learned to really pinpoint what they're focusing on more and what they notice first. So somebody telling me they think I'm pretty is different than somebody saying you have a beautiful smile. Yes. So that means that second part, that first person was almost kind of looking at me almost like a, an item, just like you would look at a car, just like you would look at a pair of shoes. Ooh, that looks good. Versus somebody who took the time and noticed a feature that essentially is equated with my happiness. When I'm happy, I smile. And you thought it was beautiful. Yes. That's so different to me. Absolutely. Absolutely. This, this conversation, it, you know, it needs to be a series. And I think it does because um, the more we talk about the false hood that we tell ourselves in our head, (laughs) the more we can level up and have 
healthier relationships and more fulfilling Definitely. experiences. Because, you know, you and I talking right now, I never said that out loud, but it was what drove me, you know? Right. And mm-hmm. I, I think we really get confused as women because we feel like we have to have the hair and the nails and the lashes and the, the body. And what men don't know, we do a lot of that for ourselves too. Yes, um, we absolutely. absolutely do it for ourselves to feel better about ourselves. But um, yet we feel like it translates into getting into a relationship that you, of substance, but it doesn't necessarily. It doesn't and then when all. it flips on us, we're confused. So I, th- yeah. So I think what, what we need to do is to just concentrate more on what it is that we really like. And in every category from how we work, who we spend time with, who we love, who we let in our beds, how we satisfy ourselves, you know, all of that. I got the finger, you go. Yeah, you have the thought there, I saw that. Yeah, because um, I think, I'll start by saying, um, like when we talk about relationships and being intimate and sex, I feel like when we focus so much on the physical, it can have, you said that earlier, it can have so much control over you and it can manipulate the way that you operate it can manipulate the way essentially cloud your entire view on that relationship and so around like october of last year i actually made the decision that to to wait until marriage so i'm like i was actually in a relationship at the time but i just made the decision like hey i really want to wait at this point i made a promise to god and i made a promise to myself because I realized that with me being intimate is it's tied to my emotion. It's very tied to my emotion. I'm not really physically like driven. It's tied to my emotion. So when that emotional side isn't there and we're not working on that, that physical side, it's not going to be good for me either. So I decided, okay, let me stop, stop the physical side and let's figure out how to fix this mental and emotional stuff. Let's figure out what I even want. What do I like? Let's connect there first. And I ultimately feel like, to be completely honest, and I haven't said that out loud on any platform, I think that that was a part of the demise of my last relationship was that the physical part, we eliminated it. And not to put all the blame on him, you know, not to say, oh, that's all he was there for, because you, you, you're you not going to be with somebody for years at a time just for that. But mm-hmm. I think that that was not only a driving factor way too much, I think that it manipulated things some, I think it clouded some things. And I think it's crazy how when you eliminate the physical, how different the relationship can be and how different you guys can realize that you are. And so I actually experienced that. And I still, to this day, I'm still holding that promise. I still am waiting for my husband. And I think that it has changed the way that I deal with people. You're not going to be here talking to me any kind of way. You're not going to be here wasting my time. You know, there's a certain standard I have in a relationship I expect you to uphold. If you can't do that, I'm just going to move on. And I feel like in the past, the physical side, um, can you, they call it, uh, what's the, they, okay, so they use the word digmatize. Have you ever heard that? Girl, oh, please, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like it's, if so that physical, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I feel like if that physical side is there, we will just let people slip and slide and mm-hmm. ice skate. And I learned that personally, eliminating that made my view so much clearer, not to say, oh, this is a terrible person, but it's like, what is going on here? Like, this is not for me. This is not what I want. You know, like when we have a big blown up fight now, there's no makeup sex afterwards to smooth things over. We really have to work this out. And you start to realize, okay, this is not something that's going to be worked out. Yes. Because the next, the the next opportunity to have sex usually smooths it over. So that's how, yeah. So that's how we manipulate each other. Men do it. Mm -hmm. Women do it. And Absolutely. it is important that we understand that what we're doing, number one, you're traumatizing the other person on the other end because there are so many other needs that are not being met. And mm-hmm. you're assuming that just sex is going to do it. It does yep. not. It's yep. great in the moment. Don't get me wrong. But <laughs> you don't have to come out at one point or another. And mm-hmm. it's, I think that the more that we again, have these conversations, men will no longer expect 
that, oh, she doesn't know any better. Women will no longer expect, oh, well, I'm going to manipulate this way and it's going to get over because now we're letting it out. We're talking about those things that need to be talked about in order to build, relate better, Mm -hmm. relate better. What happens in media is it gets sensationalized and it gets so sensationalized that we feed into the dysfunction and forget we still, after we finish watching this show, we still have to relate to one another. But then what happens subconsciously? We take that same trash into our relationships Absolutely. and build more dysfunction. Absolutely. So it's got to it, stop. Yeah, and it just generation after generation after generation will continue. And that's something that I will say I don't want for my children. I don't want in my household right now, not just the kids when they grow up. Like, I don't, don't want that for myself, mm-hmm. period. Mm-hmm. So I'm making the decision now to change those things, not just to change what I'm doing, but change what I accept. I change who I allow in my space. I actually, um, I see a marriage and family counselor regularly. Wow. Um, I think that that's something we've talked about that. That's something I think our community needs to normalize. I personally More. think just yes. like you go to the doctor and the dentist, I think we should normalize going to therapy. Going Girl, to what? Counseling. So help, period. It's so important. It and, is um, so important because we hold on to so much baggage. We don't realize mm-hmm. we do. I was just having a conversation with the gentleman I'm going to do a podcast with. His name is Eric Keese. And mm-hmm. we were just talking about how we just shove everything down. We just stuff mm-hmm. these emotions down. And if we don't give it some kind of outlet, we turn into some really crazy people. We do. I think that the the most common way we express suppressed emotion is through anger. I've actually learned that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah. So if you, if you um, bottle it up too much, eventually it's going to explode. And then when it explodes, when it explodes, usually people get hurt and you are usually one of those people. So I've learned that. um, I've learned that in working with a family counselor, just to be more particular about who I let in my space. I also have learned um, that I'm very empathetic. I have a very kind, soft heart. A lot of people, I guess, don't realize that because I'm very outspoken. I'm very no-nonsense. But Mm -hmm. I'm actually really kind. That's why you see me be more outspoken. That's why you see me seem more assertive because I'm protective of my feelings. I'm protective of my own heart. So I learned, for one, and this is something, too, that I know a lot of people don't agree with. It steps on a lot of people's toes. But I've learned to not keep giving second chances because the type of person I am, once you get a second chance, I'm probably going to keep giving you a third, a fourth, a fifth, and you don't, nobody deserves that many chances to hurt you. So I've learned that I have to, me personally, this is for me because of the type of person that I am. I have learned that I have to force myself to cut it off the first red flag. Because I have a tendency to ignore red flags. I have a tendency to give too many chances. So in order to combat that, that's something I'm actually working on now. In -hmm. order to combat that, I have to let you go. Even if I don't want you, want to, if you cross me in a certain way one time, I have to let you go. Be it, I found out you lied to me. um, Yeah, that was going to ask you what what those deal breakers are. So lies. Lying. Lying. To me, uh, just a... a a manipulative type Mm -hmm. of lie you know Mm -hmm. everybody tells little white lies hey did you like the chicken yeah i liked it and you didn't really like it i'm not gonna cut you off of that but i mean a manipulative lie in an in an attempt to hide something from me to me if i find out any part of you is completely different than what you led me to believe that is a deal breaker kiki there's so much out there like that (laughs) and and here's the sad thing when you get older, because I'm, I'm sure I could probably be your mom, I'm sure. But when, yeah, I'm, I'm up there, girl. I'm way, I'm, ooh. but <laughs> when you get older, it's the same way. It's not better. Men, my experience, my friend's experience, family, not better. The mindset has not changed, which is pathetic. And it's also scary. So at what point do we start to change the paradigm? At what point do we say, you know, 
I want a richer experience when I'm with, you know, um, friends, even girlfriends, you know, just what point do we have richer relationships? You I think, go ahead. You mentioned something about heart space and I wanted to touch on that. You said that you protect your heart and that you also um, come off as assertive when, when in, you know, in some instances. That's, you know, the angry black woman uh, DNA right there, at least right. the way society has pictured it. But what's really going on? Let's talk about that. What's really going on? It's going, we are trying to protect our heart. Uh -huh. We are noticing yes. that no one else is doing it for us. Nobody, nobody's got our back. You know, even, even with some of the intimate relationships we're in, we can't count on them to have our back. So we have to fight mm -hmm. for everything that we get. And yep. if that means protecting our space so that we protect ourselves from yet another trauma, we may come off as abrasive. It's not an angry black woman. It's a woman that's trying to survive life by Absolutely. her damn self. And you know what? I think that a lot of the time there is a misconception with that. Um, when people are, when me personally, when I'm outspoken and I'm more aggressive or uh, aggressive, or I'm more assertive and opinionated, I'm not just a protector of my own feelings. I've learned that too. I'm the type of person I feel so much and I feel it so heavily. Like I'm a creative, I'm an artist, I'm sensitive, and I really truly feel for other people in other circumstances. I'm protected for people who really I don't even know and I'll get worked up about it. You know Absolutely. what I mean? And it's because it's coming from a place of love. I really am a very kind hearted, loving person. So when I see any sort of, it's almost like a mama bear with everything. Like when it's, I see, it's exactly that. It is when that, I see it is exactly anything that. that anything that I don't feel like is right, I have my own morals and standards and values. And when I don't feel like it is right, I will be up at arms about it. And I think there's a part of that that is just the nurturer in me as, as a woman. And I think a huge part of that is being a woman of color because we are not only expected to support and protect ourselves, we have to support and protect our men, our children the other women in our community. I think that there's a different way that we have generationally had that responsibility. Absolutely. And I think that a lot of that has either been passed on to me or instilled in me or however it got there. I know that that's a huge part of who I am. You are not going to talk about my friends. You're not going to talk about my family. Um, I know I've seen situations, even I'll be completely honest, my clients, like if I have a client and I see them going back and forth with somebody, I'm like, no, you're not talking about my client, not right. my friend, not. So I just get really anything that I care about, period. I am very vocal. I'm very up at arms about it. And it comes from a place of love. And I think that a huge thing for me is that anybody who is going to be in my space, anybody who is going to love me and be with me is going to have to learn that about me. As much as I might want, if I want to work on the way I express it, you know, if I want to, because I'm working on that too. I've learned that if I don't want to be perceived as aggressive all the time, maybe I should change some things about my delivery. What and is I it, appreciate that. And what that's is what making we have people to do. think you're yeah, what's making people think you're aggressive? Because if I'm always like, no, no, I'm not mad, I'm not mad, I'm not mad, it can't just be everybody else all the time. And even yes. if it is them, if I want that to change, even it, I have two options. I can either not give a damn what they think. Or I can shift something that I'm doing so that I'm not being perceived that way. But you're doing it for yourself. You're doing for it for yourself because, because, because you want, want to be perceived differently. Change. Right. Absolutely. And not because of how they feel. And that's actually how I am. I couldn't care less about what your opinion is. I couldn't care less about you being mad at me for something. I just couldn't. Like, I couldn't care. But I personally, like I said, I'm soft hearted and I'm kind. And I don't want people to think that I'm being mean to them. Because yes. in my head, I'm like, that might have, that might hurt their feelings. If they think that I'm being mean or if they think I'm being a bitch or if they think I meant that in a negative way or in a place from anger, that hurts my feelings. Yes. For yes. you to think that, for you to think that it came from anywhere but a place of love hurts my feelings. 
So yeah. I've learned that, okay, so I need to deliver this differently so they know it's coming from a place of love. And I've actually experienced that too in a past relationship where I felt like I was almost more mothering than I should have been. And it just came from a place of feeling like I needed to protect that person. Like this person is so young. They're so naive. And, you know, they get themselves into little, you know, some people are just like that. Some people right. just get into stuff. Like mm -hmm. I've dated somebody like that. Like you're, why are you always in a predicament? But I just felt like I had to be so protective of that person. And they perceived that as controlling. Mm, yeah, yeah I had to I had to uh, learn that that is it's it's communication that was it, supposed to clear that up it's, I was just gonna really say that like, I want to know where you are not because I'm trying to keep tabs on you as a man because I truly want to know where you are and that yeah. you're okay that you're How okay you? yeah yeah and and you said it it is communication the bottom line is our black community is not we, we suck at communication. We suck at it. We love it. We love the entertainment, but we suck at it because we deep down inside feel like either nobody cares or nobody will listen. And so if we come from that space, we're not going to say what's really going on unless we're angry. Right. And it's interesting as you're explaining your path, I'm thinking, I was the total opposite. I cared about everything. I cared about what people thought of me. I cared about if they were mad at me. I cared, I cared way too much. Yeah, I didn't. Way too much. So you learned how to set your boundary, which is great. And part of it is personality too. But you learned to set your boundary. I had to learn how to set my boundary. I had to learn how not to care. You know, but I yeah. would carry that even as a broadcaster. If someone called right. me up and said that, you know, they had six kids, couldn't eat, you know, didn't have any, didn't have a way to get food, I would take that home with me, you yeah. know. So I had to learn how to um, set a boundary, but still, we still have the right to say no. We still have the right to change our mind because we're going to do it. We're women. We're going to change our mind and men have a, a right to change their minds too. Mm -hmm. It's but we're not called talking about evolving. We're about yeah. Men. We're not talking about men. I know. I know. But I know there's going to be some peep in this show that's like, and oh, I just don't want them to say, oh, they're men bashing. We're not. We yeah, men are no, and again, we just I love, want you to do your I, work. Right. I love black men. It's not to say that it's not to bash black men at all. I think right, that right. black men are amazing, just like black women are amazing. But I think that on both ends, there are ways that we could be better. And me as a black woman, there's only, of course, I'm going to have a perception of black men because I date black men. Yes. Like if, if I were dating women, I'd have a different perception. But right. in my experience, I have only dated black men so mm -hmm. my experience comes from dating black men so any feedback positive or negative it will be about dating black men and that's Absolutely. all that it is it's not Absolutely. to single them out it's not to bash them it's to say that that's my experience and let's take it a step further even those people who have other sexual preferences mm -hmm. um communication is communication no Period. matter who you're dating. In a relationship in general. Absolutely. Yes. So everything that we're absolutely. talking about now absolutely relates, although we're talking about heterosexual relationships. It mm -hmm. still I mean, you could still insert your sexual preference in this conversation mm -hmm. because it's about humanity and communication and Period. leveling up. And yes, relationships and expectations in general and the narrative that you allow somebody to give you. I've learned that in a relationship. Like I've been in a relationship and allowed somebody to tell me what was wrong with me and I started to kind of <laughs> yes. and I mean not what's wrong with me as in what I am doing wrong but I I allowed them to tell me mentally emotionally yes what was wrong with me mm -hmm. and I feel like I started to respond to that and the reason it wasn't being fixed is because you can't diagnose me with something right you know what I mean you can't tell me what I'm struggling with you can't tell me what trauma I'm or turmoil I'm dealing with on that inside but I've dealt with that too allowing somebody to and that's a part of who is telling your story I've let somebody in a relationship tell me what was wrong with me I've heard oh you're broken mm -hmm. you are broken because of what you've gone through in the past you are traumatized and I'll be honest like it's the craziest thing I've gone through a situation of domestic violence in my past where I was 
uh, very brutally assaulted. Wow. And my next relationship after that should that, never happen. Let me just say that I that agree, should never agree. happen to, to anybody. No, and um, nobody deserves that. Nobody does anything. To now my mama bear is coming out. Go ahead. No, that nobody. I agree. Nobody does anything to deserve that mm. type of thing. But I got into a place before I started dating. I got to a place where I honestly I had either moved past that or the things that hurt me were different than that. I moved past the physical part. I moved past that. There were other things I'm struggling with. But then I get into a relationship with another person and they kind of paint this narrative on me like, oh, because you were abused in the past. That is why you're responding to me like that. That is why you don't like this. And I'm like, no, I can I not just not like something? Like yeah. I don't it don't have it doesn't have to be tied to my past trauma. It doesn't have to be baggage. I really can just not like something. And I think that it's so important not to let anybody do that to you. Not to let people give you a narrative. Don't place feelings on me. Don't diagnose me with anything when you don't have the authority to do that. And I think that I struggled with that so bad in a, my past relationship was letting that person tell me like I swear I do not exaggerate it would be like you left the toilet seat up well your ex left the toilet seat up and because he was so bad to you you think I'm doing the same and it's like just put the toilet seat down <laughs> like he's not, projecting his yeah, fear onto you that, it does not have to be that deep just I'm I'm allowed to not like something case in point like female friends I'm the type of person there's only space for so many females in your life. You got your mama, you got sisters. You don't need a best friend that's a female. I'm your female best friend. Okay. Right. In relationship Amen to that. My space. And Amen. that's how I am. I do not apologize <laughs> for that at all because I have learned in years of dating, I have learned that is what works for me. Even if I've had situations where I met the girl, I'm cool with her. She's cool, fine, but she can't be your best friend. She can't mm -hmm. occupy that space. That's a space I want to occupy. Because it's an emotional tie. And that's how, that's how infidelity happens or whatever. Absolutely. It's an emotional tie. It's like, I can't get what emotional I want from Kiki, yes. so I'm going to talk to my best friend who gives right. me ABC instead of communicating with Kiki mm -hmm. or communicating in my with my relationships, person. In my relationships, I prefer to occupy that space. I don't prefer there to be another female there. But in my past relationships, um, I've heard like, oh, because that person had a female best friend and he cheated on you. Now you think that's what I'm going to do because you're so damaged. And it's like, I truly just do not like that. Why am I not allowed to not like that? So I think that um, it's important to, for one, set your standard, know your boundaries, and to stick to them and not let somebody manipulate you into not demanding that or not uh, manipulate you into tolerating something other than what you want. But because you know what? They will, they'll place those, they'll place those narratives on you. And it's like, okay, in my head, I'm like, okay, if I don't want to be perceived as this damaged, broken girl, or I don't want to be perceived as insecure. So I better just deal with it. But at the end of the day, me having a standard or me having a boundary does not denote insecurity. It does not denote um, any sort of past trauma, usually, or a lot of the time. They can exist in separate spaces. Right. So I just think it's unfair to assume that. And I think it's not fair to yourself to let somebody assume that. Well, you know what? I think the, the micro um, image of this is our society period. It's black Absolutely. culture period that we have had so many people dictate what our narrative is, even though I know we are like, no, we are controlling this narrative. We are, you're not, you're not because we're not showing up as brilliant and smart and powerful as we really are. Mm -hmm. We are have been broken down at the knees in so many ways, economically, mm -hmm. um, media largely, even from each other, because we're not learning our lesson to level up, to own our own shit and stop blaming the next person. That is so important. It's so important. I think that you could even, as you say, go a step further as far as not just in... Um, media and TV do we need to own our own and I think that it can go into our personal lives as well I learned that in a relationship like I have to bring my own substance to the table yes. I have to have the things that are mine 
inside myself, regardless of what you do. Exactly. That way, when I'm confident in mine and I know what I'm bringing to the table, I know who I am, I know what I value, I, that won't change based on what you do. Whether you're here or not, I'm a whole person. And I think that like it, I think that it, it mirrors. It's almost like a metaphor, just like you're Absolutely. saying, we need to have our own. We need to make our own. We need to put out our own media interviews, blogs, what have you, TV shows. It's just the same as a person in general. I need to express my own standards. I need to express what I value. I need to know what it is that I value and I need to know what I bring to the table. And if I am confident in myself wholly as a person, nobody else should be able to change or dictate that for me. Nobody else should be able to tell my story if I'm already telling it myself in well, any setting. You know, you, you're saying some powerful things right now. I, I've got so many thoughts in my head at one time. It's so funny. But let me just say, oftentimes, once we learn how to take up for ourselves, an, someone else's narrative gets to slip in there because they start mm -hmm. projecting their own fear onto us. So onto us. So when you're strong and in, in, in your conviction, there may be, you know, someone else saying, well, you know, i just you gave great examples with your relationships, actually, you know, because this happened to you, you're responding that way. That's sometimes a, a person's fear that mm -hmm. I am inadequate or I'm going to do something wrong to set her off. So I have mm -hmm. to keep putting this in front of her face so mm -hmm. that I can feel better about me, more secure in mm -hmm. what I'm doing. So we have to pay I attention agree. to making sure that people are not throwing their stuff on you, making it look like your stuff. Mm hmm. Because I actually, will. yes, and even so, in a past relationship, I had an experience where when I was kind of first starting out my business and I was still working a corporate job at the same time, I had someone at the time who was a uh, both a spouse and a business partner, and I felt like he was so hard on me on, oh, you, you're a worker bee, you don't work for yourself, you're not an entrepreneur, you're, not, you're too scared to take the leap or what have you, and he would also kind of like mock the fact that I had a college education, like, mm. which I think I'll start by saying, I think that's super crazy that we're living in a society that now mocks an education. Like yes. he would literally be like, Oh, that's such a scam. How much college loan debt you got, what you sat in a class learning for four years, I can get off of YouTube, you know, that, which, and I will say, I'll give a disclaimer, all of that stuff. I'm not advocating that. I think that those are red flags. And when somebody is saying that sort of stuff to you, that should have been a red flag then. But my point is to say that I realized after a while, you are actually insecure that you don't have an education. Absolutely. That's what it is. I'm like, I'm, exactly not, I'm, I'm not bringing up my degree. I'm not sitting here saying, well, I have a bachelor's. I'm not doing that. You mm -hmm. are the one who's bringing it up mm -hmm. because you are insecure. Every time we have a di disagreement, hey, this document should have been formatted like that. Hey, I think we should go in this direction with the client. It's, oh, you think just because you got a college education yes. that everybody's got it. And I'm like, who mentioned my education? So I had to realize that is an insecurity of yours. And I also had to stand up for myself and say, hey, that is something that only you can fix and only you can change. And I'm no longer even going to respond to that. You're not going to mock me. You're not going to hold me responsible for your insecurity. If you want to fix it, fine. But what you're not going to do is make me feel bad about having mine. Exactly. And good for you. Good for you. But it happens all throughout our lives with our family members, with, with a lot of people that are close to us will throw their stuff on you to make it your problem. Mm -hmm. So good for you for noticing, but that is exactly the way it looks. It looks like someone just, you know, mocking you or even religion, mocking religion or well, where's your God now? You know, that, that, that's your own secure insecurity. Those are fighting words. That was a fighting <laughs> words. Exactly. I wish. Exactly. But oh, people goodness. do it that's because so they're, they're insecure themselves or they don't mm -hmm. want to do the work themselves or they have not loved themselves enough to realize that they deserve better and they deserve more. And when you mm -hmm. when you're comfortable, I love the phrase, oh, I, this is the way I am. You just gonna have to deal with it. Really? So you're the same way you were 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. Um, and you're not going to change. That's mm -hmm. my red flag. Because we That's, should all be you know evolving. What? 
Mm -hmm. I think that another thing I've learned, I, I would never ask somebody to change who they are. A big thing that I think that we can learn, especially as women, is to distinguish behavior and character. Absolutely. Your behavior, I will ask you to change your behavior. If you are doing something and mm -hmm. I don't like it, I will say, hey, it makes me feel bad when you do this. I would appreciate it if you would not do that anymore. Yes. That's fine. That's not asking somebody to change who they are. But we have to learn to distinguish when something is somebody's character. Yes. I'm not going to ask you not to speak to me disrespectfully. Mm -hmm. That is character. I'm not going to ask you to mock my feelings when I express that I'm upset. That's not a behavior, that's character because it takes a certain type of person to do that to begin with. So I think that we have to learn to distinguish between the two. Is this a behavior that can be changed or is this who you are? Because I'm not asking you to change who you are and I'm not sticking around to wait and see if you want to change it. Amen to that. <laughs> Amen but I think it's okay. I think it's okay to say, hey, this behavior I don't like. Just like I've had situations where like communication, if I'm like, um, if I'm like, hey, I don't like it when you don't text me back until five hours later. Okay, that's a behavior. So then after that, I pay attention to how they reacted. Mm -hmm. Did they change that? Did it keep happening? Did they give me a plausible reason as to why it couldn't change? Right. And I'm but, glad you mentioned that because you mentioned a little earlier on that you cut people off, you know, on the, on the first offense, but, <laughs> but, but, you know, I I'm have, glad that you're giving it some backup because it's not like, you know, you just go around chopping relationships you know, aimlessly, you're ac absolutely giving people an opportunity by communicating what you communicating. Need first. Yes. And I'll and say for one, waiting to see if they're going to respond and, and mm -hmm. go from there. I don't forge a lot of relationships really that I will have to cut off in that way. You know, if you're just an associate, then I don't even think about it that deeply, typically. Right. But I mean, my interpersonal relationships, the people who I interact with and spend time with almost on a daily. I'm more yes. particular about that, who I'm allowing. Because they're in your personal space. space my yes. personal space. So that's what I mean when I say that. Uh, but no, I don't just, I will say a big part of that too is distinguishing what is behavior and what is character. Absolutely. So if I see something that's a red flag in your behavior, I'll bring it to your attention and then your response is going to make all the difference. All so if the you give it, in the if world. you get disrespectful, if you give me nothing but pushback and won't even listen to my reasoning, um, that's that's just not gonna work for me. Absolutely. You know what I mean? And of course, if there are character things, there are certain character things, like I said, manipulative, lying, trying to convince me you're a different person than what you are, that's character. And that's, that's past the red flag. What's past the red flag? That's, <laughs> that just know. happened to me that's, as old as I am worse. from the last relationship. Made me think that you're one way and only to find out there's something a whole different And you feel bamboozled. On. You feel absolutely. absolutely bamboozled. And I just, I can't do that. And that's it's a trauma. Absolutely. It's mm -hmm. absolutely a trauma. And it's something that you have to work out of yourself because mm -hmm. you're thinking, well, I'm very careful. I have these boundaries, you know. I'm a nice person. You know, how would they think that that's okay? And it's just amazing. There are people out there who are, well, I'll just say everybody has their own journey and they're learning as they go. But it's amazing mm -hmm. how, you know, two paths can, can merge together and you're learning from this person that you yep. never thought in a million years would turn on you. But I think that, that the more conversations we have like this, and thank you so much for choosing Black Women in Radio to, to um, bring this out. I, I love it. I love it, love it, love it. We have to do this some more. But before mm -hmm. you go, I want to talk quickly about women and girlfriends and what we can do to make that relationship better. That. Uh, I know, it's a whole nother series, but I, I it, just want to touch a, on it. I... I will honestly say that I do not have a lot of female friends. I probably have, outside of my online friends, I have yeah. a lot of online friends, but we haven't actually met in person. We haven't actually interacted on that level. Of, but as far as people who I really interact with in real life, in person, I really could say I only have like one person who I would call a friend. And still working on 
figuring out why that is. But I think that I just, I don't know why. I think that, uh, to be honest, I feel like I could probably have more friends in a circle if that was what I desired. But I don't particularly care for that. I don't care for meaningless conversation. I don't forge meaningless relationships. Yes. And I honestly am, I honestly am shy, even though I'm outspoken. Once you get to know me, I'm more outspoken. But initially I am shy. So I think that might have something to do with it too. But I don't have a lot of friends. And I think I've had, I've been in a space where I did have a whole circle of little girlfriends I was hanging out with, but there was just too much yeah. going on. It's either it's too much emotion, it's too much drama, yeah. it's too much, it's just too much everything. And um, not to bash any women, but in my experience, that's what was happening. And because I didn't want that or because I felt like I don't want to be that way, not even to say I wasn't that way too. I probably contributed to some of the drama, but I got to a space where I'm like, this is not what I want in my life. So I started removing myself from those relationships. And honestly, I think I'm at an age, I'm 28. So I'm at an age where I think a lot of those relationships just naturally started to fall off. And they they did. did. I think that mm -hmm. we just started going in. I'm in a space right now and at an age where we just naturally started to go in different directions. Somebody got a job here. Somebody got married. Somebody moved to this state and we just didn't stay as close. I actually spoke to my mom and my aunt about that and they told me they were like, honey, like, don't worry about that. You haven't even met really the people who are going to be your lifelong friends. We're talking colleagues at your career. We're talking neighbors when you buy a home, yeah. that sort of thing. And they were saying like, you haven't gotten to that space yet where you're even meeting those kind of people. Maybe a friend of your husband or, you know, your husband's sister or somebody in that sort of circle. That is how you start meeting those people that you really, really become lifelong friends with if you were not already friends with them from like a child. So I think that maybe I'm just in to, maybe I'm just in that space because I don't have I don't have a lot of friends in general at all. I don't have any male friends. I'll say just because in any experience I've had with male friends, they always try to take it a step further. They do every single time, unless they, they were gay. Unless they were uh, gay, I've mm -hmm. had a couple friends that were gay, but the heterosexual friends they have always tried to take it a step further. Yeah, and even when you're you, even when you're thinking that you know it is a friendship space and they crop up they and say something like of the time in my experience they have mm -hmm. but I would like to have I think I'm also in a space now where I could start forging those relationships now I think I had to move past some of the stuff I was going through in my life there's some relationship stuff I was going through of uh, some family stuff that I really just didn't have the space for friends who weren't genuinely positively supportive and adding to my life. Absolutely. And that's, that's the prerequisite for me, being genuine, being honest and adding on to, because, you know, when you're creatives, you tend to do all of the adding and you look mm -hmm. around and it's like, uh, I want some of that. <laughs> that that's you. And that's why I don't have a lot of friends too, is because I'm a gift. I really am. I, I keep saying that, but I'm a giver. And I, I've learned, my pastor actually told me this. He said to let go of those things that don't service you and mm -hmm. stop pouring more into situations than they that pour into serve you. you. Absolutely. It's not, it's not to say that you're always physically going to get something. It's not to say that they're going to be doing the same thing that you're doing. But it's to say that no situation should take more out of you than what you get. You should be getting something back mutually. Absolutely. It should always be mutually beneficial. So I know I'm the type of friend that I'm, I require time and attention. If my man is acting up, I need you to pick up the phone and listen to me talk about yes. how he's acting up. But I personally don't receive that as much. You know what I mean? You can talk to me all day long, but I'm going to be like, and don't try to fix it. Just listen. Right. I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to try to fix your problem. That's not what I, I kind of, I don't receive that, but I like to, I don't give that so much as I like to receive that from friends. I'm the type of friends that friend that physically 
we'll be there for you. If you're going through something, you need somebody to watch your kids, I'm there. Maybe you were short on a bill and I can contribute somehow how I'm there. I'm that friend that, you know, when everybody, I live in Atlanta, a lot of people don't like, they're not from here. I'm that person who has the big holiday dinner because everybody couldn't go home on the holiday. That's mm -hmm. more so what I bring to the table. So I think that it's needing people who value that. And I just, I guess, haven't met them yet and also I think I'm almost a little bit of like a hermit I'm in the house all the time because I work so much mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I think it's as I think it's as easy as getting out I will ask you this how do you feel like as far as forging relationships with women and building a circle of long-lasting friends I always see that and I wonder that I'm like you know how did like you guys literally built it's like six of you and y'all love each other to death and y'all would do anything for each other. I personally don't feel like I've ever had that. No, I pretty much lived that life through um, sex in the city or, or girlfriends, you know, some that, television. I, I, I envy that <laughs> so much. That is one, I do that too. Is, <laughs> one of my favorite shows actually is girlfriends. And I think that that would be so awesome. I always think that it would be awesome to have people you can really rely on like that. Yeah. People who are not going to tell your business, people who, if you're going through something, they have your back, you know, that sort of thing. I think it would be cool to not just have one friend, but even a group of people surrounding me that was like that. I'm just not in that space in my life right now. Well, that's why I mentioned earlier. It's like, that's one reason why we feel so defensive is because we don't have that support system. Support system. And if and we can important. learn to become that for each other, I think that, you know, it will enrich a lot of lives and, and the best way to become a part of that network for anyone is to learn how to communicate, learn how to navigate yeah. your own emotions, know the difference between putting your own, your own fear and insecurities on somebody else's life, you know, speak life into other people, make them feel worthy and expect the same. And if we can learn yeah. how to be, um, more like that, I think there was, you would start to see more uh, units of friends. There, I'm, I'm just amazed that sometimes I'll interview someone and they'll have that relationship or that family unit and, and, you know, all of those things in place. And gosh, I guess there's, there's just, I'm not it. I'm, I'm not it. I've had to work for a healthy relationship or mold it into what I think it should look like. Cause I don't have a whole lot of examples. Only example I had was the Huxtables. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. You know, they're are, they're all what they are, but I didn't want to I'll say them. that too. You know what? You just reminded me of that. I think that that's also why I'm different. Um, when it comes to operating with friends, I have five sisters. Oh, see, so, so you have enough I, of that intimate yeah, connection. Growing, yeah. that, that's what it is, I think. I think I would even be a bad example to go by because I don't, I'm like, I, I don't have to deal with your mess. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't have to deal with the cattiness. I don't have to deal with the backstabbing uh, or the co constant competition. I have five sisters, and the good thing about us being sisters is, for one, we're all, we know each other very well. We all bring something different to the family and to the group and we all value what the other brings because we've grown up with them being their self. You know Key what I mean? So, valuing them because I, mm -hmm. I can think of some sisters that cannot get along and they're just the worst, you know, <laughs> group of folks together. They're great separate, but they're just the worst together. together. And and because there's jealousies there and there's traumas there that hadn't been uh, address there's there's uh, anger and all of that and, and I just think just as a whole if all of us if you didn't take anything away from this conversation at all if we all would just take a step back and learn how we can level up ourselves yeah. then we'll attract I those agree. people that mer uh, mirror the kind of people that we're trying to be absolutely you know? I agree I agree. But yeah, that's probably a huge part of the reason why I don't even I'll say when it comes to making female friends, I have a lot of like associates again and colleagues, but and clients that I get really kind of on a personal level with my clients, which is great. But I don't have a lot of like friends that I like go out with because that's the space that my sisters occupy. And I think that's a, that's something that I was just blessed with in coming from such a big family because we are 
there's a lot of us and we all really are close and close knit and tight and we really truly love each other and I think that that is a blessing because like you said there's a lot of situations where that's not the case but I'm blessed enough to have a great relationship with each and every one of my siblings so I don't even really feel the need to you know fight through some of the obstacles that you would have when it comes to making friends yeah well you know what I so appreciate you I appreciate how much you've shared. And, and this is a really rich conversation. You and always get a lot out of me. <laughs> you have a way of pulling it out. Well, I love it. And um, as far as the show is concerned, I know you're no longer on the show. Um, but what I would really love is that, you know, we pay attention to what our boundaries are and, and how we want to be, you know, seen in the mm-hmm. world and is it worth a dollar is it worth just a sound bite and you know our lives are, are much more worthy of rich conversations and love experiences than mm-hmm. to feed into somebody else's idea of what our relationship that looks like be. yeah mm-hmm. so thank Absolutely. you so much thank you i appreciate you having me it's always great talking to you you too. You too. And I wish you all the best. Do you have any projects you want to tell us about? Thank you. I do. I still um, I still operate my company independently now. Um, it's called Taste Marketing and Digital Media. We've completely rebranded and changed directions and it's doing phenomenally since um, I've been really since I've been rebranding and kind of controlling the thing myself. So I'm excited about that because I am the creative. And I think that in the past, I was a little less vocal about what I thought. And um, a lot of my ideas initially were shot down. So I have the opportunity now to actually do these ideas. So let's put a trap beat behind it. You know what I mean? Like, yes. let's put some, use a trick daddy beat. Let's use some ludicrous instrumentals. And I've seen such a great return to that. And I'm blessed because in my past, relationship not relationship my past partnership I wasn't as much able to do the creative things that I wanted to do so I'm seeing such a great response to that and I'm so thankful to you know my audience who is responding and they continue to patronize with me so that's definitely something to check out is my company taste marketing and digital media it's not just branding and graphic design we actually specialize in content marketing so my theory is that if your content is good enough, everything else should follow suit. So you want something that's so eye-catching and so amazing that people can't help but listen to what you're saying. Absolutely. Um, I actually have another project that is up and coming now um, called Boss Charm School. So what Boss Charm School is, is um, for years I was praised for my customer service in taste my marketing company, and I was praised for my poise in public speaking and how I kind of handled situations. And I know you know, working in the field we work in, sometimes PR can be a nightmare. Oh, yeah. And and I actually am very skilled at kind of curtailing the negativity and spinning it to a positive. So, um, and I do that for a lot of my clients with taste, but what I found was there's a lot of people who were afforded the opportunity to start a business, but they because of social media and the digital age, but they don't really have the background that will be necessary to offer great customer service, to structure your systems to where um, you can communicate with your clients regularly or say with PR, like why are we clapping back to customers? Yes, that's the, that's, so I have seen that play out even with celebrities. It's like, is, believe it or not, and I have I have clients who are celebrities as well. Don't I do that. Of course, I have clients who are celebrities that we kind of step in and I call it a brand polish yes. to where we'll kind of come up with a strategy of how you can do that, but do it better. Yes. You can always, I, I believe in business, the customer is not always right. And if you mm-hmm. abide by that theory, you can come out of pocket a lot for that. So I think whoever is right is right. You're just always supposed to be respectful and professional. That's so the key. That's, 
that's essentially what I'm teaching with my brand boss charm school. So I'll have kind of packages that you can purchase where we can just come in almost like restaurant impossible. If you're familiar mm-hmm. with it, yeah. where we'll have, we'll come in and we'll pretty much do a whole 360 to fix these customer service issues, fix your PR and um, turn it around as far as your image. And then we have, just coaching on verbiage because I feel like a lot of us again weren't afforded that opportunity to learn what is standard in the business community like for instance I have people who will get so antsy about an email they'll be like I've emailed you three times in two days and it's kind of like why did you feel like you needed to email anybody three times in a 48 hour time span right that's something that they don't they don't know any better you know they're just starting out their businesses so I'm just teaching that I also have my third brand that is actually kind of, it's kind of running itself by now. It's called Favors for Pop. It's inspired by my grandfather where I used to, because he wasn't able, I used to go and get him his snacks and his personals. And when he passed away, um, I decided that I wanted to continue doing that for other people like him. That's really neat. And all of that, there's information on all of that on my personal social media page. And which is? It's, it's Keandria Damone. If you're on Facebook, it's just Keandria Damone. Instagram is just Keandria. Now, I'm a different woman on Twitter. So. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> That's where I can just really say what I want to say, do whatever I want to do, yes. because it's not tied to my businesses at all. Yes. So if you want to look me up on Twitter, I am on there. It's Kiki Damone, I think. But you can feel free to look me up on Twitter, too. But you're not going to find as much business stuff there. Yes. Well, you know what? I wish you all the best. You are such a dynamic, beautiful woman, full of great creativity. As a matter of fact, the branding is right up our alley. So we'll we'll have to talk. And just Uh, all the best to you. Thank you. Ah, ah, here we go. I joined the army immediately after high school. I hadn't even turned 18 yet. That's how it all began. You're just as popular as, as, as your last whatever it was. We need to keep it simple and, and, and encourage and remind people how they are the apple of God's eye and our eye. That if they feel there's nobody else in the world that loves them, we love them. You love them. I love them. And if there's no other way to tell them but on the radio and you really mean it, they're knowing you believe they know you mean it and they feel it. It's a whole different mindset now, but the need and the heart of the listener and or viewer hasn't changed. Hey, you know, get on it, doggone it. <laughs>